So basically, I'm going to talk about sexual harassment, and I want to show of hands, before I give the definition, how many of you thus far have been sexually harassed. Not fun. So according to the RAIN Center, that's Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network, 81% of women, and we do believe that to be a low number, are sexually harassed over the course of their lifetime. 81% of women. So that's obviously 8 out of every 10. I believe it more to be 9.5 or 10 out of every 10, but that's just me. And the reason I asked to talk to you guys about this is because so many of my patients have experienced dramatic forms of sexual harassment. I myself, unfortunately, have experienced a lot of sexual harassment over the course of my life. And even though people are more aware of what not to do now, it's, it's just, it's totally not acceptable. Anything that makes your skin crawl is simply not acceptable. And now we have last Friday being arrested, which, you know, I know somebody that actually flew out from LA that he sexually abused, who wanted to just watch him do the perp walk. And she'll never come forward, she'll never say anything. She switched her career. She went to Harvard, she went out there as an intern. He raped her. She switched her career, but she wanted to see him do that perp walk because it was important to her. And she's not famous. She switched into something else entirely. She's in finance now, which is where she thinks she should have been all along. I will start off by saying something personal. My daughter, when I was younger, I'll say, she was 11, Jade is 15 now. We were in Miami, and that was the first time I was with her that we experienced my daughter being sexually harassed. And she was 11, and I was livid. And I said to the man that was saying rude things about her as we were in the street in Miami, that she was 11. Because he was talking about he would take the small one and what he would do with the small one, and that his friend could have the big one, which I guess would be me, the big one. Um, I'm not that tall, I'm only 5'6", and I just went off on them. But this is what this culture is. Some of this culture is, and it's completely unacceptable. So what I want you guys to remember is that you're not alone. That's first and foremost. And then if someone's making you feel uncomfortable, intimidating you, making you feel like you want to just like back up a little bit, that type of thing, you're, you're not imagining it. So standing too close to you, requesting closed door meetings, telling you to smile more and relax, recommending you wear more makeup, recommending you wear your hair a different way, buying you perfume, suggesting a perfume for you to wear, all of those things, late nights, early morning meetings where the two of you are alone, all of this can be a problem. And that has to do with the way the individual is making you feel. And these things should be reported. And that's all there is to it. So you don't allow somebody to touch you if you're not comfortable. You just don't. You just you back up and you look at them like they're crazy. My brothers, I have two younger brothers, they're ex-models, they're extremely rude. They were very, very popular growing up. And they said, well, you know, Jeanine, you have a resting, and I'm going to use a swear word, you have a resting bitch face. I'm so surprised that anybody would even start with you. And I don't think I have a mean face, but I just think I have a get out of here with that kind of a face. And so that can help me some. All right, so my story from high school, I went to public school in North Jersey. I'm the daughter of a doctor. I traveled extensively, went to public high school, private college. The... The coach for the high school football team, which was a winning football team, decided that he was going to sexually harass me. He told me that if I did not perform oral sex on him, and you guys know what that is, that uh, I would get, be getting a C in football. Now, I probably deserve a C in football because I still don't understand football now as an adult. I will totally openly admit that, and I take care of like a quarter of the Jets and like half of the Giants, and I still don't understand anything about football. But I wanted to go to a recognized college, and I wanted to be a doctor, and I was not trying to get a C in gym with all honors classes. So I was livid, and I went to my vice principal. I was in student government. I was, you know, whatever, you know, straight A student. And um, I went and talked to the vice principal, and looking back, she was a huge advocate of mine, Miss Minister. She was 6'1", gray hair, no makeup, just a very, very serious, well put together woman. And I told her the story and I saw her neck, that vasovagal thing, where her neck flushed and she flushed all over her face because she heard it before, but not so convincingly. And so she said that she was gonna hide behind a door. So we had to pick a very tall door for the six foot one woman to hide behind. And I was to say it again. I was to trap him because we didn't have cell phones back then, right? This is the 80s. So, she hides behind a door. I ask him,
his last name was, Mr. exactly what would I have to do? And he goes through a very long description of what I would have to do to get the A, involving exactly where I would have to put my lips. Unbelievable. She, halfway through his description, jumps out from behind the door, this man's 6'5", and puts her spindly hands around his neck. And I laughed, and I said, I guess I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Seven women came forward. We all went back to Miss Minister again. They would not fire this man because he had a winning football team. But he was no longer allowed to grade. I mean, he liked women with, with boobs is what it was. And everybody had that one common factor. So he was so rude and so inappropriate. The administration knew, the board of directors knew, the, the, the school board of ed knew, because I went to speak about it in front of the board of ed, because I was just done with them. I was like, fire him, he's a parasite. And they would not fire him. They would not do anything. So that was my high school story. But, I got an A in football that I didn't deserve <laughs> from this minister, and that was that. You know, I went on to, I went to Tufts undergraduate for, is anybody going to Tufts in this class? Yay, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Um, I still interview for them now. So anyway, so that was my high school story. Um, in med school, it was really, it was bad. I had my tire slashed for not performing oral sex on somebody. I had a teacher personally go after me. He was a cardiologist. He went and he went, he went after me. He just, you know, coming up to me, breathing in my space, trying to touch me, you know, late nights, early mornings, you're there, you're a third year medical student, you're on call. Oh, you know, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, you're not being where you're supposed to be. This, is, this was all not true. <laughs> Ultimately, what, what he decided to do is he decided that he was going to tell a bunch of my friends that were in my year, that's the third year of medical school, that he'd had sex with me on his desktop, on his desk, in his office, that he'd had sex with me. Okay? So he was playing basketball with a group of third year and fourth year medical students, and he mentioned this sleazy Jeanine Downey and how he had sex with me and how great I was and this, that, and the other thing. And he was playing basketball with my then boyfriend and some of his friends. And they dropped the ball, and they stopped, and they looked at him, and they said, we know you're after her, we know she's not interested, why don't you just leave it alone and not say that? Because if Janine finds out what you're doing, it's gonna be a problem. And he proceeded, and he you know, proclaimed, I'm fabulous, and he had a sweaty head, and it was fabulous, and we were gonna do it again. Anyway, so somebody comes back and tells me immediately, and um, the next morning, I went to his office, I pushed past the secretary. His desk looked like something from 1972 that hadn't been cleaned off in a thousand years. <laughs> it had all these tchotchkes and dust and books. And he was meeting with um, the anatomy professor, who I really liked a lot, and I didn't want him to have a bad opinion of me. So I walked in and I apologized to the anatomy professor for what I was about to do, and then I took my arm and I cleaned everything off his desk so that he could have sex with somebody else, just not with me. Um, <laughs> He didn't think that's funny, they called security. I walked down the hall. You know how you always see in movies that if you run, they figure out it's you? So I just walked down the hall. Security was coming up the hall, they totally missed me. And then I went to the dean's office. And then I, I cried. I made myself cry. I sat at the dean's office. And I was just like, I can't believe why this is happening to me. And this is just the most awful thing. And he's the most horrible man. And I'm going to have to change universities. And this is just terrible. And the dean was like, there, there, Janine, and gave me some tissues. <laughs> you know, calm yourself down, it's going to be okay. And I'm like, check him up. And so he came over, and um, I had ruined some of his property. That's terrible. He had ruined my name, my good name. I don't really care about your property. Sue me. I'm broke. I have debt. I'm in medical school. Sue me now, that would be a different story, but sue me back then. So what happened after that is they did not fire him. He was doing a lot of research, he brought a lot of money into the institution, they did not fire him. I heard the same thing from high school. I heard from a multiplicity of other women who had done this with him, who had done that with him, who had ignored him, who he had harassed. He stayed. So I would paint my nails, a nice shade of violet. He had a white car. I would take the nail polish and I would put it on the hood of his car. <laughs> you have to strip the car and you have to repaint it. It's expensive. And then I would wipe his windshield wipers. 
the different security guards. And so they would be like, oh, um, sister, his car's over there. <laughs> I had them turn cameras so they could park under a camera. And I would just come and I, you know, I still make a mean brownie now, you can ask my daughter, but I would come with brownies because I was broke. So I couldn't pay the security guards anything. I would just bearing brownies and they'd be like, I graduated and all of a sudden miraculously it stopped. I faked and I said it was, you know, other people doing it and I had no idea and I went before the deans and it was what it was. And they kind of all knew it was me and they kind of knew he deserved it, so they just let it sit. But the bottom line is I had nothing. I had no equipment. What do you guys have now that I didn't have? Thank you. Videotape it. Audio tape it. Do it. If you are feeling uncomfortable. I mean, the sexual harassment movement started in 1989 with Anita Hill, okay? So, who I believe to this day. Videotape it, audio tape it, do something about it. Don't just sit there, it only gets worse. And the more they feel you nervous and shaking and like they have power over you, the worse it can possibly get. And I don't want that for any of you. I don't want that for my daughter. I don't want that for any young woman out there. You guys have power with Steve Jobs and your phone, so I expect you to use it. You have no idea how many patients, you know, just kind of take things and then bring it to human resources, like this is what's going on at work. Take things in the dean's office. You know, one of the, one of the very stellar institutions, um, you know, mid-country, Baylor, um, you know, somebody had to tape the dean saying something completely inappropriate. And after four different things of that nature came up, the dean is now on a permanent, it looks like it's going to a permanent suspension. But you take things. That's what you do. That's what I, this is one of my patients that was involved in this, and that's kind of what I did. So I think it's really important that you use what you have for the best of you. I have a stalker. I do a lot of, well, some, not a lot of TV, so I do a lot of Good Morning America, I do The Today Show, I do Dr. Oz, I do The View, I do a decent amount of TV. So according to this person that was stalking me, he said that I telepathed him that I wanted to see him. <coughs> so I can't telepath anybody anything ever, okay? I'm not a medium, I'm just a dermatologist. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, so he sends me a naked picture with the Santa hat on at Christmas. And I'm like, this is a joke, right? And then it became not a joke. So I practiced in Montclair, New Jersey. Pay a lot of taxes in Montclair. I would think the police department would be very, very, very responsive. <laughs> so the police department, somebody comes over, an officer, Dominican guy. Very appropriate in front of my husband. Very appropriate. He wanted um, information, he wanted the pictures, he wanted the letters. Um, my husband is a lawyer. My husband is an ex-captain in the Army. My husband is a no-nonsense kind of a guy. He was very appropriate with him. When he was just with me, he told me that any time I put myself on TV, that I am putting myself out there, that this entire stalking thing is my fault, and that perhaps I should just drop my little TV career and just be content to be a dermatologist. This is what he told me. I went to complain to the Montclair Police Department to some Irish chief above him. And I was told that every time I drive out of my driveway of image dermatology, I'd be pulled over for speeding. I said, what are you talking about? I don't speed when I'm pulling out of my driveway at work. I don't do that. Well, every time, if you register this complaint, every time you pull over, I rescinded the complaint. I said, okay, I'm rescinding the complaint. He goes, now you get what I'm saying. There was a woman sitting there listening to the whole conversation. She wouldn't look up at me. She wouldn't give me eye contact. I just, that's how it was at the Montclair Police Department. They were so not helpful that I had to actually go to the Essex County <coughs> Police Department. And they intervened and they, you know, contacted him and they didn't stop. And this went on for about two and a half years where 
I'm carrying mace, I'm paranoid, I'm wondering about my daughter's safety, I'm wondering about my husband's safety. Just crazy. But they did nothing because stalking is not taken seriously by many, many people, including if you're famous and definitely like me if you're not famous. You know? So it was kind of crazy. I carry mace all the time. I have it in my car right now. I have some at work. I travel. When I travel, I check it and I put it in something that says asthma medication. I don't want anybody messing with it. I don't want anybody to mace themselves by accident while they're going through my bag. And it has a safety lock on it. But this is something to discuss with your parents, ladies. When you go to college, when my seniors go off to college and I see them coming in for acne or whatever they're coming in for laser hair removal before they go away to college, a lot of my patients will have the backpack and they'll have a sticker on a black vial that says asthma medication and they don't have asthma. And that's because that's my recommendation of where they can hide either pepper spray or mace. This is an individual decision that I made that I recommend you each talk to your parents about. But I will tell you that over the years, about seven out of probably hundreds, more than hundreds maybe, of my young women have told me they've had to use in a bad situation to get out of or away from something that they were delighted they had the pepper spray. And pepper spray is legal. You can get it from AutoZone. I think mace is maybe not legal. A little bit stronger. Not that I care when it comes to my safety. Sorry? It's not New Jersey. It's not. Yeah, you have to ship it to another state. Right. Or you can just you can just you know you can just happily buy it off the internet too. But pepper spray is here. And pepper spray is used, you know, all the time. I mean I just somebody asked me what I had mace in my car for. And I said, Oh, you know, just in case there's vermin. <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> yeah. So but I mean, it's important for you guys to think about protecting yourselves in this college campus assault era. And so I want you guys to think about what you're going to do and how you're going to position to protect yourselves. Okay? Um, so, the stories that my patients tell me, the stories that um, I've told you, I hope that they mean something to you in terms of wanting to protect yourself and wanting to just be aware. Be smart, be aware, um, and try not to be drunk or high in a social setting. It just uptons you. It just does. It's really unfortunate. That woman at Stanford, I have a lot of patients that go to Stanford right now. That young woman at Stanford that was so drunk that those two, the, excuse me, yes, the two boys were assaulting her, but the one in particular that didn't get any penalty for assaulting her and like basically got six months in jail. He had assaulted other people in the past. You know, the judge felt like there was camaraderie between him and Rob because I guess Rob was a swim champ and the judge was an ex-swim champ. You know, that type of thing. You just, there's so few prosecutions, it's absolutely crazy. What's my statistic for this? Every 98 seconds an American is sexually assaulted. Every eight minutes that victim is a child. And only six out of a thousand perpetrators of the crime will actually go to prison. Only six out of a thousand. So if it can just not happen, because you have pressure spray, because you scream, because you weren't that drunk to begin with, those are good things also. Those are things in terms of keeping yourself together. You know what I'm saying? When I travel, do you guys remember what happened with, you know, the name Erin Andrews at all? That pretty one? So I'm friendly with her. I met her um, years ago on the Today Show. Um, we're not friends, I'm just friendly with her. I liked her. I felt so bad for her when they put a camera into her peephole and taped her and put it out for the world to see. And she's right, it did really mess up a part of her life. Psychologically, she was completely impacted by that. And I'm glad for whatever huge settlement she got. I think she deserved to get that. So I traveled with stickies. Stickies were made by a housewife. Did you guys know that? Housewife in the Midwest somewhere, I think it was. But anyway, I traveled with stickies. I put them on top of my people. And I put a sign there after they removed the first one the first day, and I said, do not remove. I'm not interested in anybody looking into my hotel room. Last year, I traveled 197,000 miles. You know, I lecture a lot, I travel a lot, I go to great places, and I meet weird people sometimes. And I just am not interested in having anybody peeping into my hotel room. So cover your peephole of your door. Make sure you put your chain on before you get in the shower so they don't have access to your room 
while you're in the shower. Unfortunately, in a lot of hotels around the country, when people see women traveling by themselves that are attractive, they wait to hear the shower, and then you can hear the door click when they go in while you're in the shower. Don't let that happen. Just put the safety lock on. It's just two seconds, and it's completely worth it. So these are the things I want you guys to think about in terms of your safety, in terms of making sure that you're not sexually harassed. Um, in the workplace, do any of you know what you want to do for your career yet? Like no-no? Yeah. Yeah. Sports analytics. Sports analytics. Do you have a mentor already? No. Okay. All right. But that's good. That's great. You love sports, huh? Yeah. What's your favorite? Baseball. Oh, funny. Okay. I'm an excellent champ. Baseball's not my favorite, but I think there's some baseball players too. They get mad, they come in, and I don't recognize them, and they get offended. I'm like, you don't want a stalker. If you were a fashion designer, I'd know who you were. <laughs> um, anybody else know, know what they want to do? Um, athletic trainer. Athletic trainer. And do you have a mentor? Uh, kind of. Like the woman that uh, senior came, she was an alumni mm -hmm. um, from her place, Leslie Nixon. Mm -hmm. I've been talking to her. So. Good. Good, good, good. Anybody else? Uh, lawyer and the judge. Lawyer and the judge. Excellent. Do you have a mentor? Yeah. Good. Good, good. Um, um, marketing and advertising in the cosmetic industry. In the cosmetic industry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did a lot of work for Christian Dior over the years. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can introduce you to. Um, do you have a mentor? Uh, not yet, but I have a few questions. Good. Okay. All right, cool. I mean, the bottom line is the reason I'm asking about mentors specifically is because Mentors in the workplace can tell you, don't meet with him at 6 a.m. before you start work at 8. They can say, don't meet with that person. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't go for coffee. Don't do this. They can help to guide you just that little bit that can be very helpful. But sometimes mentors can compete a little bit, and that's an issue, and that can be a problem. So not all friends are friends. You guys, unfortunately, as seniors, you already know that not all friends are friends, right? Yeah, it's a tough lesson. Doesn't it suck? You know, people just need to be happy for each other. But many times they're not. So I do want you guys to get mentors when you can and listen to their advice, but take everything with a grain of salt and put it through your own personality lens. What you feel more comfortable with, what you feel better with, what you feel is more and more and more appropriate. The drugs thing. So you guys know about the family from, well, you know, around here, quite frankly, that um, went to Mexico, oh, this happened within the past year, and they all got drugged, <coughs> and they were raped, and they were, you know, things were stolen from them. Okay, so, you know, with regard to this whole sexual assault, sexual harassment thing, you have to be smart about where you're going on vacation these days, because what they do is, unfortunately, in some places, they target entire families. They actually raped the dad of that family to keep him from saying anything and to shame him is why they did it. And you know, they raped everybody in the family, they stole jewelry, they stole this, they stole that. I mean, it was just, it was kind of a crazy story. But it all started off with them putting things in drinks. So you guys have heard your parents tell you a thousand times, you know, please don't drink. Well, please don't drink, but if you do drink, don't put your drink down. If you put your drink down, get another drink. You know, be responsible for yourself. Because at the end of the day, you will be the one to suffer the consequences if you're not responsible for yourself. The whole drugs thing, the whole Molly thing, you guys are well aware of Molly and you know some of the things that it's done and maybe you personally know people that it's affected. Well, one of my patients thought she was having, you know, beer, and they put Molly in it and she has a cardiac issue and she is was just it beautiful 20 in an ivy league college and she had some heart thing with the molly and she died within an hour of it being put in her drink she had no idea so you know i just want you guys to think about that also now while she was passing away the people that put it in her drink thought that she was drunk. They didn't realize that she was dying. So they raped her as she was dying. So her parents had that joy to think about also. Yeah, they did. I, I know, I can see your face, isn't that just awful? So, I mean, I've got stories. 
So, and this is somebody that is, she would, she would be one of your friends. I considered her a patient, but I considered her, I mean, I was seeing her from the time she was like eight years old. You know, I was in shock about the whole thing. So, you know, I'm assuming that you guys don't have any underlying heart deficits, but you never know how a drug is going to interact with your personal body chemistry until you take that drug. And if somebody slips that drug into your drink, then, you know, you don't even have a fighting chance. So I just want you guys to be smart and be thoughtful and be aware of that. Look at Michigan State. 300 plus, some boys too, to shame them, to shut up. If you notice, the boys he raped all have sisters that he had already raped. So they wanted, he wanted to keep promoting that culture of silence. But if something doesn't feel good, in 1997, people started talking about him. Okay? In 1997, if something doesn't feel good, say something. So if you're uncomfortable, you need to speak up about it. And you need to continue saying stuff. And you need to say stuff again and again and again and again until somebody hears you. I think that's critical. So, like I was saying to you guys before, your decisions about how you protect yourself are totally up to you and your parents. So discuss pepper spray, discuss mace, discuss whether or not you're gonna carry it on a clip on the side of your bag. Discuss with your parents what your plans are in terms of your habits in college. Just be open about it. You might as well, you're about to leave, you're about to go away, you're about to get in the big open world. But the bottom line is, I want you guys to be careful, I want you guys to be thoughtful, I want you guys to be prepared, and I don't want you to have what Erin had with somebody looking through her people, what I had with the stalker, and what I had with somebody trying to lie about me and disgrace my reputation. No, I do think now when I look back, what I did in medical school with that obnoxious professor's car was very immature of me, but you know, I was in my 20s, I was immature. You know what I'm saying? So I, can, I kind of did what I did at the time, I don't regret it at all right now, but it's one of those things that you think about it and you think, did he change because of my actions? And the answer is no. I heard two years after I left that he attacked somebody and they still did nothing. And this is two years after I left my medical school. So, I mean, you just have to think about what your big take home message to somebody that's harassing you is going to be. But like I said, with taping it now, you guys have a weapon that I simply didn't have. So I think that's fabulous. So I just wanted to tell you guys that I'm concerned. I'm thoughtful about this. This has happened to me many times before. I do a lot of consulting. I do a lot of clinical trials. I do a lot of speaking. And so sometimes I'm in situations where I'm the only one. I'm the only woman. I went to Norway for a conference one time and I'm thinking to myself, is there any female that's gonna step in this room? You put yourself in these awkward situations sometimes. That was fine, the regions are very friendly and it was very freezing cold, but I had a great time. Um, you know, the bottom line is that in order to advance your career, I want you guys to take risks. I'm a risk taker. I think you guys are too, that's why you're here at Kent Place. But I want you guys to think about what your options are, weigh your options, and be very, very, very deadly serious about what your goals and what your desires are, and what you do want to do, and what you do not want to do. Well, just mind, if somebody's standing too close to you, if they're breathing your air, if they're making your skin crawl, if the main word that you think is ick, then, you know, remember that old cartoon, don't just stand there muttly, do something? Said much funnier than that. <laughs> don't just stand there muttly, do something. Take your camera out. Make sure your battery's charged. That's another thing. There's no reason with these new iPhones for your battery to be dead. That makes me nuts. The woman that breaks down the highway that has a dead phone, just don't do that. Don't put yourself in those situations. Have your phone charged. But do something about your situation so you can change your situation. And I wish each and every one of you tons of good luck in your careers.